Uh, as a background, Perthes disease or leg cave Perthes is an idiopathic painful disorder of childhood characterized by AVN of the femoral head. Uh, described in 1910 by those three authors, the worldwide incidence is about 1 in 10,000 higher in those populations, Japanese, Inuits and Central Europeans, uh, lower in Native Australians, um, so Ab Aborigines, um, people of African descent. Uh, and the usual patient is 4 to 10 years old, although the highest incidence is between the ages of 5 to 8. Um, the male to female ratio, depending on which paper you read, is either 4 to 1 or 5 to 1. Uh, the condition may be in isolation or as part of a general disorder of growth. Um, they do talk about children who have Perthes seeming young for their age and being quite small um, in opposition to those kind of kids that get Sufis. Um, some association with inherited thrombo, um, so that should be thrombophilia, not thromophilia, um, antithrombotic factor deficiencies and high, sorry, hypofibrinolysis. This was at 2 a.m. this morning, so I apologise for that. Uh, recent studies uh, suggest that there's a type 2 collagen mutation. Type 2 collagen is a, is a collagen that's found in highline cartilage um, as opposed to the common collagen which is type 1 that you find in scars and healing tissues and whatnot. Um, I think it's also found in the vitreous humour of the eye, but at the start of the beginning. Okay, etiology. Um, there's a paper in 2007, a Japanese paper by Miyamoto et al. Uh, that looked at a Japanese family that had a Perthes incidence that was following an autosomal, autosomal dominant pattern. Uh, they, they were found to have a um, missense mutation in the type 2 collagen gene. One of the, uh, one of the uh, amino acid residues was changed over. Um, the affected members tended to not to display clear abnormalities elsewhere, interestingly. Um, such a mutation, however, is not reported in non-familial bilateral cases. Um, I'm not sure about non-familiar unilateral cases, but the authors uh, specify that specifically. Uh, thrombophilia remains controversial as a cause. I think in the mid-90s there was a bit of a trend to think that thrombophilia would be a fairly major factor, but it's less so recently. Um, consistency is not found across the literature. There's a 94 paper saying that 75% um, percent of those who have Perthes will have a coagulation abnormality. Um, however, more recent studies are not supporting that figure. Um, so it, it, the punchline of all that is we don't really know. We have an idea, but we don't really know. So the pathogenesis, um, obviously if it's an AVN type situation, disruption of blood flow is going to be key. Uh, acquisition of tissue samples is obviously difficult, so the models that we use are porcine. Um, there are more recent studies suggesting they're using um, bisphosphonates, and in bisphosphonates they're showing that the uh, decay of the femoral head is not as profound, which is suggestive that obviously the resorptive part um, of this mechanism is key. Uh, so essentially how it goes, it affects the, the cartilage can be thought of as in, in three layers, a superficial layer, a middle layer and a deep layer. The process primarily affects the middle and deep layers of the cartilage and essentially where you go is you get disruption of the blood supply for whatever reason, um, cartilage necrosis and enchondral ossification ceases you get um, bone and marrow necrosis um, through, the, through the forming trabecular bone, uh, you have, which is subchondral, you have a fracture and separation of the cartilage from the bony surface and you get fracture through the, through the actual um, bone. You get areas of trabecular compression um, and then at, with, with, over, over the period of time after the initial period of necrosis, you then get gradual, gradual revascularization um, restoration of uh, the sort of end condrosification and then you get you sort of progress from this initial sort of fragmenting phase back over into a healing phase um, and then you end up with this depending I mean we'll talk about the classification in the end but let's uh, let's say you don't go back to a normal looking head you'll end up with this sort of residual area of compression and necrosis um, reossifying areas and what is often a um, I suppose dysmorphic head uh, right. This over a period of some years. Um, so there's also an importance of critical load in the in literature. Essentially, what they're saying is that the that that trabecular bone that's fracturing. Um, they're saying that it, it appears to be have have a higher mineral content, so it's it's more brittle than standard bone, especially for kids, and that that has got something to do with the way it collapses and also the degree of 
um, predilection of the bone may something to do with the degree of, of, of deformity. Um, the extent of head involvement, degree of imbalance between resorption and formation, and level of loading are likely to affect the degree of deformity. Um, when I talk about level of loading, these authors talk about the fact that in a normal gait cycle, you put about 2.5 times your body weight through your hip. In running, you put about 4.5 times your body weight through your hip. Um, and so they talk about you know how hyperactive kids seem to, to have a predilection for having worse birthdays than, say, the standard indolent game playing, video game playing kid. Um, and the a graph here essentially shows um, from the time of disease onset um, how the mechanical strength of the actual femoral head changes. So the green line is, is the normal side. So with, with the passage of time, the mechanical strength is gradually increasing with maturation. Um, however, in, the, in a per phase hip, um, they, once, once the process starts, they have a gradual... Uh, they have a gradual decline in the mechanical strength and degree, depending on how much you load the hip, um, you, you worsen the deformity. Uh, we'll talk about that in terms of management and, and how we use different bracing and, and limited weight bearing type protocols to make the disease less profound. Okay, so clinical features of the condition. Uh, as I said, the range is four to 10, most commonly five to eight. Bilateral disease is seen in about between 10 to 15%, depending on the paper. Patients often appear younger, but their bone age may be delayed. When I say appear younger, that's obviously they're all young, but they appear younger than their chronological age. Um, some literature notes about these hyperactive children that may be loading their hips more. Uh, these authors talk about perthase being a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, things like sickle cell disease, steroid induced AVN, cellular displays must be excluded. Onset is insidious, symptoms are usually mild pain. They may or may not have decreased range of motion, often depending on the stage. When they do, it's typically an AB duction, internal rotation, and they pre may present with a limp. They may have a Trendelenburg sign. They may have synovitis, um, which can be persistent. Uh, symptoms can also be paroxysmal. They can come and go for a while. Um, muscle changes and limb length discrepancy may be present. Again, this is contingent upon the severity of the disease and the duration. Okay, uh, imaging. Imaging for perthase is still developing, but on x-ray they talk about four stages. Um, you see an initial stage of increased radio density, initial stage of increased radio density, a fragmentation stage that lasts up to a year, um, a re-ossification stage that lasts for three years to five years. Uh, there's, across the, across the papers, it's pretty much agreed that uh, Reossification will take longer in an older patient, so on the old, old, old age of that spectrum of 5 to 10. Um, and there's also a greater degree of flattening with longer reossification time. And also, the older you are, you tend to have, you tend to do require sort of more aggressive treatment, is, is my understanding, and also tend to do slightly worse. Um, and then finally, they'll, they'll have the healed stage where they end up with what they're going to end up. Um, Obviously, X-ray won't show you anything about the vascularity of your um, of your femoral head. For that, you can you can use MRI. Um, some centres are looking at developing 3D MRI in kids uh, to look at the degree of sphericity and deformity of the femoral head. So, what's the natural history of perthase? Um, if you look at the long-term studies that were done, sort of in the 80s and in the 90s one that this paper refers to, um, less than 40 year follow-up suggests that patients do very well. Um, however, longer term studies are less encouraging. Uh, an American study in the 80s suggested that with a mean follow-up of 47.7 years, 40% maintained a good level of function. This is, this is an Iowa study using the Iowa hip score. 40% um, required total hip arthroplasty, 10% had disabling pain, and 10% had an Iowa hip score of more than 80, which is very poor function. Uh, Currently, there's a couple of different classification systems, but the paper, this paper talks about the Stuhlberg classification. Uh, this is essentially looking at the sort of appearance on X-ray of, of the head as compared to, and then looking at how they go at various times. So if you've got, a, obviously, if you've got a, um, so, the way, so each class, there's looking at the X-ray appearance, uh, and then 
Yeah. So as, as the, the sort of explains that radiographic signs of OA at mean 40 is a follow-up and radiogra radiographic evidence of joint space narrowing. So you may show signs of OA without showing signs of narrowing at the mean 40 follow-up. And obviously, the more severe the, dys the, the uh, dysmorphic head, um, the worse you tend to do. So if you've got a sort of a Stuhlberg 5, you're, you know, by, by age 40, you're doing, you're doing pretty poorly. Okay, so these are um, various classification systems and prognostic indicators of patients with Perth A's. Um, the extent of head deformity is, which we talked about in the Stuhlberg classification. The age of onset is a prognostic factor. Um, the extent of subchondral fracture, which is the Salter Thomas classification. Uh, the, the figure in the top, the top picture, is the Catterall classification. Um, in a Catterall group one, they're basically um, showing that you've got patchy areas within the head um, with, no, with no actual sequestrum of AVN. Uh, in group two, it's looking essentially at only the anterior part of the head um, with sequestrum. In group three, uh, there's only a small part of the epiphysis left, left not involved. And in group four and catarol, it's basically the entirety of the head is involved. Um, the other classification they look at is the lateral pillar height, which is the bottom picture. And um, so essentially, in, on the first figure, you can see how the, the femoral head's been divided into um, lateral, middle, and medial pillars. And they're looking at the lateral pillar height in term, as a prognostic factor. So in group A, the, while you, you can see fragmentation, you don't see any change in the height of the lateral pillar. In group B, you see reduction um, down, up, down to, up to sort of from 100 to 50 percent, and in group C, it's less than 50 percent of the lateral pillar remains. Um, and obviously, premature physial closure is, is part of the prognostic factors. So, um, in terms of management of these patients, in this paper, they've essentially divided up the patients into three groups, looking at the age of onset, so less than six, six to eight, and older than eight, and they're basing this on two studies. The first study is the Perth A study group, which is a paper that the primary author of this paper was involved in, which is published in JBJS American. And the second study um, is a Norway study that I believe was published in JBJS British uh, in 2008. <laughs> They've kind of relied on the Perth A study group paper more because that was actually based on skeletal maturity, whereas I don't think the other paper followed the patients all the way through. So in the age less than six group, they basically said in the natural history of if you have Perth A's at less than six, you often you frequently achieve, I think, in 50 to 60 percent roughly, but I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure, I don't remember that figure exactly. They went on to Stuhlberg one or two at maturity, sort of regardless of what you did. Um, they looked at symptomatic um, management as being sort of, they looked at sort of, if you do nothing, symptomatic management only, or give them physio and braces of various kinds, um, you actually showed no significant difference between the groups. And that was even if they had a casual three or four level of involvement. So there's another study done that um, went to cattle three and four per Thayer's hips. They had a physiotherapy regime, a Scottish right orthosis, which is sort of like an, an A-shaped hip and thigh brace um, versus a various osteotomy. And they, they all sort of went on to the to similar levels of function or dysfunction um, at a later stage. So the overall recommendation was that if you're in the A, if you're less than six, manage it conservatively and you tend to do quite well. The six to eight group was, was trickier. Um, so what, what this is actually looking at, this is the, um, the Perth Day study group outcome in, from the JBJS American paper. So what they're essentially doing is looking at no treatment, um, allowing them to range normally, um, and then having some weight bearing restrictions, having a brace, um, having an innominate or pelvic bone osteotomy, or having a femoral um, osteotomy. And they're looking then at skeletal maturity, what their stool bird radiographic outcome has been for each treatment group. So at six to eight, what they're showing is that 68% of the people that 68% of the patients that had an osteotomy remained in the in sort of the in the better Stuhlberg end, whereas only with only 32% progressed to um, a higher Stuhlberg 
classification, whereas in the no treatment group, 73% um, were still BERT3 or higher. Um, in, in the <laughs> older, than eight, older than eight group, femoral osteotomy wasn't so much, like in, in both groups, femoral osteotomy still has a significant portion progressing to a higher Stuhlberg level, but um, doing sort of bracing um, is less effective at that age is, is, is one of the main findings of this study. So if only sort of only 40% in your six to eight group progress to a high Stuhlberg classification in um, once you're past eight in terms of your age of onset, you're doing much more poorly with, 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 with bracing or range of motion alone. So the, the basic premise of the paper is that older than eight, you can lean towards surgery. Less than six, you can pretty much safely do quite conservative things. In the six to eight group, well, that, that will sort of depend on um, so, so surgeon experience, surgeon preference, the absence or presence of a protocol if you're going to use Petri bracing or um, an SRO. Yeah, the, the problem with this paper, though, is that their numbers are relatively small. And the difference between the groups was not always significant at each level. Um, in particular, the and, and the authors make note of that, um, the femoral osteotomy group, although their numbers suggested it, other papers that have had also small groups have, have been the other way around, where they've shown that bracing is significantly better than osteotomizing. Um, I'm, I haven't worked with the children, I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure what we do here. I'll ask Mr. Harrison a tick, but um, essentially, this is, yeah, it's, it's all contentious is the point. Um, but, yeah. And, and I think this paper acknowledges that. It also talks about, um, yeah, so identification of the problem as well. And then they also talk about a, a conflict between identifying the problem and when you actually intervene. Um, there are papers that suggest you should wait to be able to fully classify what, where they're going to be. Um, and, or, and other papers that suggest, well, once you've got signs, you should intervene at that stage. From my reading beyond this paper, it seems that you can, you, you've got the luxury of waiting in your younger age of onset patients. Anyway, um, but at, in the older patient, you probably won't wait for them to fully declare. And I'd have to refer to Mr. Harris as well. Um, yeah. Uh, in the end, um, the author sort of said, well, that they, the author seemed to favour a use of an A frame, which is, in terms of position, I, my understanding is not very dissimilar from broomsticks. Um, it's uh, initially they, they, their protocol is 12, 12 hours for three months, uh, overnight of course, and then they taper that to eight hours, um, and the bracing period is one year. Um, the shelf acetabuloplasty, um, I, there was, there's not a lot of literature sort of supporting it. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of this um, recent paper that Mr. Harris is referring to, um, and there was some mention in this in this paper, the JOS paper, about external fixation having been shown to protect the head when applied earlier, have a restorative effect when applied at a later stage, but that um, has a Um, so in the end, and I like <laughs> so in the in the end, um, 
The cause remains obscure. Apparently, the treatment is somewhat obscure as well. Um, prognostic factors will include the age of onset, later being worse, the degree of deformity, the extent of head involvement, and signs of head risk, which is across those different classifications. Um, the classifications become less useful in the older patient, as per these authors. Um, obviously, imaging and prognostication tools are still improving. Uh, surgery is not really indicated in the younger patient, and treatments are still developing, um, even so many years later.